a very good morning uh, to you all uh, dear brethren around the world greetings of peace uh, and joy to all uh, in the name of our uh, almighty god and our returned and reigning king uh, uh, jesus christ i bring you love and greetings uh, of many brethren from india and especially from my family i thank uh, our lord for giving me the opportunity to serve his flock and i also thank the convention committee for giving me the opportunity to serve the brethren today our study is based on the verse written by apostle paul in first corinthians chapter 10 verse 11 now all these things happened unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the hands of the world are come the title of the discourse is jehova nisi this is partly based on the writings of our uh, beloved brother charles tays russell from uh, reprints number 4207 and uh, reprints number 5285 i would like to present this as a suggestion to all the saints to ponder upon dear brethren we all know the bitter experiences of uh, israel while they dwelt in egypt they settled in uh, egypt uh, during the days of uh, joseph but later when the pharaoh who lived uh, during the days of uh, joseph died and the uh, other pharaoh came he began to afflict them with a hard labor and made them slaves to pharaoh and uh, pharaoh had appointed taskmasters on them who made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of services in the field wherein they made them serve with rigor so that the israel may never have sufficient of time to think about their god thus the people of israel were vexed and cried to god for a deliverance from a egyptian bondage the bible says in exodus 2:24 that god heard their groaning and god remembered his covenant with abraham isaac and with jacob and in due time god raised moses to deliver israel out of egyptian bondage to the promised land through 10 plagues Moses delivered them out of Egypt to the promised land before and God had told their fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob about the promised land that it was a land flowing with milk and honey yet they came to the border of the promised land the israelites uh, sent spies into the promised land to see if that land was as god as promised twelve spies were sent one from each tribe of israel after the spying the promised land all the elders came with a evil report except Joshua and Caleb saying the land is good but uh, there are giants whom we cannot defeat 
which disgrace the hearts of many. Hearing this, uh, the Israelites uh, decided to stone Moses and appoint a new leader and return to Egypt. Because of their doubts uh, about God's promises, that God would fight for them or not, God punished them and made them to wander in the wilderness uh, for 40 years. So all of them who were 20 years of age and older perished in the wilderness. Of all those who left Egypt, it was only Joshua and Caleb who entered the promised land. Dear brethren, in spite of all these murmurings and grumblings in their wilderness journey, God punished them but never forsake them. The clothes they wore did not tear. The sandals they wore were never worn out. During the day, God gave them shelter from the hot sun through clouds. And during the night, God gave them free lighting from the pillar of clouds. Every day in the morning, free food was delivered to their doorsteps. The manna, which was like wafers made out of honey, it was like uh, eating a honey cake, the imagination of which brings uh, water in our mouth. Whenever they wanted to eat meat, even that was door delivered and that too unlimited. Whenever there was danger, God was always ready to fight for them and fought for them. Today, we are going to study the first fight of Israel after the deliverance from Egypt, which is given to us in the book of Exodus chapter 17. We will first go through this chapter verse by verse and see what actually happened there. And later on, we will see what spiritual lessons we have for ourselves. So, dear brethren, we read in Exodus uh, chapter 17, verse uh, 1, it says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. The people of Israel had been journeying for a long time without any rest. And hence, by the time they came to Rephidim, all the water that they had was over. And Rephidim was a very hot valley surrounded by granite stones due to which the heat was more severe than what the people could bear. Adding uh, to this, uh, all their water was over and hence uh, the people began to fight with uh, Moses. We can read that in verse 2. Therefore, the people did uh, 
child with uh, Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? The people of Israel had soon forgotten the miracle that God had done at Mara, where the bitter water was sweetened. Instead of requesting and praying to the Lord for water, as usual, they began to grumble against God and fight with Moses. Therefore, Moses said, Why do you tempt God? Then in verse 3, we see, The people thirsted they for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is that uh, thou hast uh, brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Moses uh, had been uh, used to such experiences with these murmurers. Hence, uh, as usual, Moses took the entire matter to the Lord in prayer. And we read in verse 4, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto these people? They be almost ready to stone me. And what did the Lord reply to Moses? Verse 5, and The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherein those Moses the river take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of elders of Israel. Dear brethren, when Moses took the rod that he used to part the Red Sea and smote the rock, water came out. How did the water come? Did it come like a tap water? No. In Psalm 78 chapter verses 15 and 16 it says He claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused water to run down like a river. Dear brethren, it was a, a river that flowed from the rock. And how will the waters be that come out of the rocks? It will be chill and pure. For the people who were thirsty, this was exactly what they wanted. It completely quenched their thirst. They were satisfied, happy, relaxed and rested because they were totally exhausted and weak. Now came the danger, dear brethren. So we read in Exodus uh, chapter 17 verse 8 that uh, then came Amalek and he fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, who are these uh, Amalekites? How did they attack the people of Israel? It is given to us in book of Deuteronomy 
25th chapter verses 17 to 18. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way. When you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the inmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and ye feared not God. Dear brethren, the Amalekites uh, did not come uh, and attack the stronger ones uh, from the front. Remember, but they came and attacked those who were weak from the back. Now, usually while traveling in a crowd, who will be the ones who usually lag behind? It will be the elderly, women, children. So, this means the Amalekites came and attacked the weaker elderly ones, especially the women and children. This was actually a direct violation of war rules. Even today, dear brethren, the war rules are that no one shall attack women and children, neither the elderly. Attacking from back is uh, especially like backstabbing, which is forbidden in the war rules and uh, shows uh, covertness. In such a situation, Abraham, we all know that uh, Moses usually prayed to God for his guidance, whether to fight or not. And if we have to fight, how to fight? Similarly, here, Moses prayed to the Lord to find out what the Lord will and advice was. Then Joshua was commanded by God to go and fight with the Amalekites. See verse 9 and 10. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out of men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek and Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Joshua was commanded to fight the Amalek while Moses was to go up on the Mount of Horeb along with Aaron and Hur lift up his hands and pray to the Lord for the battle. Verse 11 tells, It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when the Moses laid down his hand, the Amalekites prevailed. Now, dear brethren, how much can Moses hold up his hand? So both Aaron and Hur supported Moses. One of them held his left hand. The other held his right hand. Thus, both of these support, Moses continually prayed, lifting his hands while Joshua defeated the Amalekites. Verse 12 and 13, it says, But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone, put it under him, and he sat uh, thereon. And Aaron and Hur stirred up his hands, the one on the one side, 
the other on the other side and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun and joshua discomforted amalek and his people with the edge of the sword god told moses never to forget this incident he told joshua and moses to write it in a book as a memorial for ever and ever see verse 14 to 16 and the lord said unto moses write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the years of joshua for i will utterly put out the remembrance of amalek from under heaven and moses built an altar and called the name of it jehovah nisi for he said because the lord has sworn the lord will have war with amalek from generation to generation hence we see the brethren that this was written in the book so the people of israel would never forget about what the amalekites did for them that they would have a perpetual war with them and moses built an altar to offer sacrifices to god and called that altar as a jehovah nisi meaning the lord's banner dear brethren we all know for what's over things were written of our time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort in the scriptures might have hope romans 15:4 this is also mentioned in first corinthians 10 chapter verse 11 that now all these things happened unto them for examples that they are written for our admonition upon whom the hands of the world are come so then within what lesson do we have in this narration what does uh, egypt mean you see what does uh, israel mean what does uh, moses uh, represent what does the land of canaan mean what does it mean that uh, israel walked with moses what uh, does uh, the murmurings of israel represent what does uh, the rock that moses smote uh, from which uh, the water came represent who are the amalekites whom does it uh, represent we all know that uh, for the bible you see the brethren a bible is his own dictionary so whatever uh, we want uh, to decode uh, the bible we need to search all the codes from the bible itself hence uh, the bible says uh, dear brethren hear a little hear a little search the scriptures none shall miss or meet isaiah 28 uh, verse 10 and isaiah 34 verse uh, 16 so dear brethren if we search the scriptures diligently god will definitely give us the answer so we all know very well that egypt you see represents the world and pharaoh the prince of egypt represents the prince of the world satan the god of this world and pharaoh's uh, servants represents the fallen angels who are under the influence of the devil 
whose task is to make slaves to sin. And the people of Israel, you see, represents God's uh, people who are captivated by slavery. As they cried, God heard their cry and sent Moses. And uh, who does Moses represent here? Moses here represents uh, our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, uh, whom God sent uh, to save God's children, you see, from uh, bondage of sin and death. Moses led them to, uh, you see, Canaan, the promised land. And even so, Christ is leading all of uh, God's children to the heavenly Canaan. As Israel followed uh, Moses, Similarly, God's children, we are all following Jesus' footsteps. But yet, Israel murmured, grumbled and questioned God. Similarly, sometimes we also question God regarding water, regarding so many truths like what God, when God, why God? Why there is difference among ourselves? Why someone is rich? Why some are poor? Why some are educated? Why some are not educated? Why some are so happy? Why some are sad? Why different experiences for different people? And so many other questions. Dear brethren, how did God answer all these questions? God told Moses to take the rod with him and smite the rock so that water might come out of the rock and quench their thirst. Similarly, God answered all our questions through the rock that was smitten Jesus. Moses took the rod and smote the rod with the rod. What is the rod? The law was the rod. The law under which Jesus was born it is because of the Lord that Jesus was smitten. And through the smitten rock, Jesus, the water of truth, came out. Therefore, we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it says that all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Jesus is the rock through who which God draws us to the truth. John 6.44 It says, No man can come to me except the Father who has sent me draw him. It was because of the Lord that the Jesus was crucified. It is because of the death of Jesus that we have been able to receive the spirit of understanding and uh, the truth. Uh, this water quenched the thirst uh, of uh, Israel. Similarly, the living water has completely satisfied all our questions. Uh, given us answer everything from the scriptures. And in response, what did we do? The people of Israel, they were relaxed, satisfied, rejoiced. Similarly, we also rejoiced and relaxed by consecrating ourselves to God. So, was everything over? 
no that was the beginning when the people of israel were relaxing the amalekites came and attacked from behind similarly many people think dear brethren that if we are consecrated that is sufficient a seat is reserved for us in heaven just consecrating is not sufficient dear brethren it is only after consecration that the real battle begins that is the time that our enemy the amalekites come to attack us from behind it is only after our consecration that the real life real fight for the new creature begins therefore apostle paul said in first corinthians 10 verse 12 wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall who are the samalakesh dear brethren who came and attacked the people of israel from behind for the bible bible is the dictionary as i told you before seek you out of the book of the lord and read none of these shall fail none shall want or mate here a little there a little isaiah 3416 and isaiah 2810 about the amalekites it is first given in genesis 3612 that Timna was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore to Eliphaz Amalek, which means Amalek was the grandson of Esau. And uh, what do we study about Esau in the Bible? It is Esau who for uh, one morsel of uh, meat sold uh, his birthright for you know how that uh, afterward uh, when he had inherited the blessings uh, he was rejected for he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears hebrews 12 chapter Verses sixteen to seventeen. Hence, uh, these Amalekites represents the people who are very careless about God's blessings. And uh, we have already read how in Deuteronomy twenty fifth chapter verses seventeen to nineteen, how they attacked Israel. They feared not God. and uh, these were the first enemies of israel and these were the worst enemies of israel they attacked the people from behind and uh, they attacked uh, only when the people were faint and weary these are the highlighting characters of the amalekites now who does this amalekites represent this is our deadliest enemy you see and this is the worst of all the enemy we all know dear brethren you see the new creature has uh, some enemies and how many enemies do we have how many enemies do the new creature have the new creature has four enemies the world the devil the flesh and uh, babylon is also one of the enemies of the new creature brother russell tells this one in uh, sixth volume okay now among all these enemies which is the worst of all the enemy the deadliest and the worst of all the enemies which are listed here it is our flesh our flesh is the worst of all the enemies therefore apostle paul says in romans 7:18 for i know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing 
our flesh is the deadliest of all enemies we can control everything and overcome everything but controlling and overcoming our flesh is a very difficult task therefore in proverbs 16:32 it says he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he that ruleth is spirit than he that taketh the city when does uh, our flesh attack us when we are feeling relaxed after serving the lord when uh, we feel satisfied in the lord that is the time the flesh attacks us so we read dear brethren in james first chapter verses 14 and 15 it says but every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust and enticed then when lust had conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death again uh, we read in galatians 5:16 dear brethren this i say then walk in the spirit you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh if we stop walking in the footsteps of our lord by daily carrying the cross and following him automatically we will be pulled by the current of the flesh this is a very subtle enemy it doesn't attack us directly but attacks us from behind when we are relaxed and at rest you see that is the time this flesh attacks us so when do we feel relaxed if we serve the lord two or three days continuously in a week we feel very happy satisfied that we are pleasing to the lord we have done so many things for the lord conducted so many meetings visited so many places brought so many to the truth established so many ecclesias and done so many other things that is the time the flesh says oh you have done so many things you need to take rest so flesh tells us take a little bit of rest watch a movie go out spend some time with friends watch your favorite game you see etc that is the time when the danger comes dear brethren many of god's people in the bible we read that they were careless in understanding god's will they thought as god was pleased with them god would also be pleased if they made small mistakes here and there and god would definitely overlook them you see like for example uh, king huzia uh, had done so many good things and god had accepted all his good works he thought god would be pleased with him even if he offered an incense on the altar which was actually the work of the priest but when he had a censer in his hand to burn the incense what happened dear brethren the leprosy even rose up in his forehead till his feet and they thrust him out of the temple yes he himself hasted out to go because the lord had smitten him he was a leper unto the day of his death dear brethren and dwelt in several houses being a leper 
for he was cut off uh, from the house of the Lord. Second Chronicles, 22nd chapter, verses 16 to 21. Dear brethren, we also read about Moses who led the people of Israel to the promised land. Moses was told to smite the rock. He obeyed the Lord. But the second time, when God told him to speak to the rock, he instead smote the rock twice. Then the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Wherefore, uh, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7 to 12. Dear brethren, it was just a small mistake. But yet, Moses, the meekest man of all in earth, was never taken to the promised land of Canaan. Dear brethren, when David sought to bring the Ark of Covenant up to Jerusalem, when the ox stumbled, making the Ark to tilt, Uzzah steadied the Ark with his hand. It was a direct violation of divine law. He was immediately killed by the Lord. For his uh, error. Dear brethren, these were just uh, minute small mistakes. But they were very serious in the sight of the Lord. God of Israel never compromises with sin and disobedience. Dear brethren, if we are like uh, any of the above, these are the signs of spiritual degradation. And our prayer might be like that of a Pharisee who prayed to God, telling about his righteousness. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as the publican. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. But the publican also prayed. The publican standing afar off would not lift up uh, so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his heart, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Among these two, who was justified, dear brethren? The publican was justified rather than the Pharisee. Similarly, how should our hearts be after doing all the Lord's work? We should say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Luke 17.10 says, it is only of his grace and just his grace is sufficient for us. Dear brethren, the other way of a flesh uh, attacking us is to stop ceasing to keep our consecration work. What happens is that automatically the flesh pulls us out of the narrow way. We are all naturally created for this earth, which itself is a great natural magnet as the metals gets pulled to the magnet, <coughs> similarly, our flesh pulls towards the world away from God. This gravitational pull is always there. If you simply cease to walk spiritually, then naturally, dear brethren, all earthly things will pull us back into the world. The flesh attacks us just like an enemy attacks uh, a fortified uh, fort uh, at night when everybody is sleeping. Dear brethren, the other way of uh, 
flesh uh, attacking his his uh, to make uh, good appear bad and bad appear good the simplified uh, for unimportant things uh, and make it feel that we are fighting for righteousness sake what did jesus say dear brethren he said clearly in matthew 24:12 Iniquity shall abound and love of many shall wax cold. As the closing of the door to the high calling gets nearer and nearer, many shall fall. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at the right hand. Because the sifting process will happen rampantly where the brethren shall betray brethren to death. The father, the son, the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Mark 13, 12. Hence, yeah. it is, uh, our, it, hence it is not our duty <inaudible> to fight uh, with flesh uh, and blood. Dear brethren, in Revelation 22nd chapter, Verses 11 to 12, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust. Still, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. My reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Dear brethren, we should try to work out our own salvation, not that of others, with fear and trembling. This the Lord permits to see if we are faithful to him or not. The other way of the flesh, you see, attacking is the misapplication of the scriptures. For example, in Romans 8.28, it says, uh, For we know all things will work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Some people misunderstand the concept of offering their body as a living sacrifice to God and think that not doing any work and uh, to earn their daily bread is actually a sacrifice. But instead, it is actually a lazy. And they forget the scriptures, which clearly says, if any provide not for his own, especially for his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. First Timothy 5, 8. And to justify themselves by thinking that this is working for their good. Some don't even come to the church. Not to the ecclesia. They will be occupied in the world. Yet they think, oh, this is working for their good. Still some don't even read the Bible. But have time to spend it on social media. And think that all these things will be working for good. When opportunities are given, they are still quiet. And miss all the opportunity. And justify themselves saying that everything will work out for good. If this continues, then dear brethren, tomorrow they might lose the crown. Or even go to second death. If they go to second death, just because uh, they did nothing or did not even work out their own salvation? Does it really work out for their good? No. God has called us to be of the little flock, uh, not of the great multitude. Uh, we should uh, always try to overcome our flesh. Uh, the crown is to him that to overcome it, uh, even as Jesus also overcame and is set down with the Father on his throne. Revelation 3.21 So dear brethren, what was the advice that God gave regarding the Amalekites? In Deuteronomy 
25th chapter verse 17 to 19 god clearly said remember what this deadly enemy did unto you so let us be careful about what this enemy the flesh did to us what he is doing now what all can he do in the future dear brethren this is what God actually told to the first king of Israel, King Saul. You see, dear brethren, he told to destroy all the Amalekites, not to spare any of them, neither children, nor the old ones, nor the animals. But uh, Saul, you see, spared King Agag, the best of the sheep, and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was bale and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. First Samuel 59. When Saul came and questioned him, he said, yes, I have done God's will. Ambition, pride, ego, hypocrisy had blinded him, dear brethren. Even when Samuel would correct him, he would not listen. So what happened was that King Saul's kingdom was taken from him and given to David. So similarly, dear brethren, we should destroy all our Amalekites, small, great, old, children, women. Everything that is there, destroy everything. And we try to destroy bad things in us, like telling lies, using bad words, cheating, etc. But do we really kill ambition, pride, ego, jealousy, anger, politics? We say all these things are required to serve the Lord better. Or the people will misuse us. These are the things we need to kill at any cost, dear brethren. If we don't kill, what will happen? We see what happened to King Saul. He was rejected from being the king. Similarly, we will also lose our kingship. What did Jesus say? Revelation 3.11 Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast uh, that which thou hast, uh, that no man take thy crown. King Saul didn't destroy the Amalekites. Hence, God permitted the Amalekites to kill King Saul. That is God's judgment. Uh, similarly, we read in Romans 8.13 For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Wherefore, we should crucify our flesh daily, carry the cross daily and follow Jesus. Jesus also said that he who loses his life for my sake shall save it. And he who saves his life for my sake you see, we lose it. Then what uh, should I do? How should I fight this Amalekite? Dear brethren, the people of Israel had no experience of war. You see, they could not fight themselves. So they prayed to the Lord for guidance. And God guided them. It is the same guidance that God is giving us today, dear brethren. We can't fight alone. We need help from Christ. Moses went up on the mount, lifted up his hands and prayed to the people. Whenever his hands were lifted, the Amalekites were defeated. But whenever his hands were let down, the Amalekites won the battle. Similarly, now Christ has gone to heaven, seated upon the Father's right hand and he is praying for us. 
you might all wonder how brother how is this possible actually we should pray for uh, huh? god correct but how come the christ is praying for us how can you pray to christ how is this possible how can christ uh, pray for us let us read romans 8:34 it says who is he that condemneth it is christ that died ya rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of god who also make intercession for us you see dear brethren christ is at the right hand of god making intercessions for us when moses stopped praying israel lost similarly does christ stop to pray for us yes dear brethren when does christ stop to pray for us when we are not walking properly after the spirit that is the time that we lose the victory without him we can't do anything if we are obedient then we will be able to fight which actually means that christ is interceding for us if christ has to intercede for us then we need to try to fight our battle here the lord will surely help us the lord needs our willingness and our support to fight the battle dear brethren sometimes the request are made to pray for brethren while well, actually the brethren themselves wouldn't be interested and would be living a worldly life would such a prayer be of any use to that brother no dear brother not at all no if our prayers has to be answered and we need to overcome and thus support our lord he needs our interest our submission our obedience our zeal and our energy then only can god work in us we need to surrender to him sometimes dear brethren moses got tired and his hands were let down so aaron and hur two of them supported moses hands what does this mean what do aaron and hur represents aaron was actually the brother of moses and hur was actually the brother in law of moses aaron means elevated hur means noble the two things supporting moses actually represents the two characters that should be in us which god likes very much this is the most elevated this is the most noble character in us dear brethren so which is this character that god likes very much aha uh -huh. this is the same character which god actually saw in jesus because of which jesus was anointed above all his fellow angels this is given to us in hebrews first chapter verse 9 thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity therefore god even thy god had anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows jesus loved righteousness and hated iniquity when did jesus love righteousness dear brethren though it brought much disadvantage our lord loved righteousness only when did jesus hate iniquity though it brought much advantage our lord hated iniquity dear brethren and the pharisees and sadducees violated god's commandment he called them brood of vipers he didn't condemn only the pharisees you see and the sadducees dear brethren when one of his own favorite disciples did things that were not pleasing to god Christ said get behind me satan Christ loved righteousness at any cost 
and hated iniquity at any loss. Because of this, God lifted him high and anointed him with a high, with the oil of gladness above all his fellow dear brethren. Similarly, if we have this beautiful character, we can get God's grace, mercy to fight and win over our flesh. Dear brethren, Joshua, through whom the battle was won, was later given the opportunity to be the deliverer of the whole Israel. If we are faithful in little things, uh, our new creature in the resurrection will be given the opportunity to be faithful in greater things and to rule with Christ uh, for a thousand years. Uh. After this victory, dear brethren, <clears throat> Moses built an altar and called the name Jehovah Nisi, meaning the banner of Jehovah. The altar in the olden days was actually a sign of gratitude to God. For example, in Genesis uh, 12 chapter, uh, Abraham built an altar in honor and gratitude to God. Moses built an altar because this was the first war and the first victory for Israel over its enemies. They were not prepared, dear brethren. They did not have any arms, uh, swords, uh, spears, yet God gave them the victory. Realizing our unworthiness, God's grace upon us, we should build an altar and sacrifice to God all our time and talents, etc. God said this war with uh, the Amalekites would be from generation to generation. Exodus 17, 16. Similarly, our warfare with our flesh is not for one day, dear brethren. For a few years or a few date, nothing. It is a lifelong process, dear brethren. But in Numbers 24, 20, it says at the later end of the Amalekites, shall be that he perish forever. Similarly, one day we will see that our flesh will be totally destroyed. God will give us a divine body and the divine nature, dear brethren. Why did God permit the Amalekites to attack Israel? Because Israel had no experience to fight. This was an experience to fight the future battles. God was preparing Israel to fight the future battles. Hence, this experience was very, very important. God thus prepared them for the future battles. Similarly, dear brethren, when we have some fights within our lives, let us not be discouraged, dear brethren. Let us think that God is preparing us for some battles and strengthening us for the future. So let us all be thankful to God for such a beautiful, wonderful experiences. Uh, amen. May the Lord add his blessings to the understanding of his holy words. I once again thank my Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, for this opportunity and the convention committee for giving me the opportunity to serve his little flock. I also thank the translator brethren for translating the Lord's words in various languages. If anyone has any questions, uh, you can definitely ask me. I'll be posting the subject uh, on the Zoom chat. God bless all. Till we meet again. Thank you. So thank you, brother, uh, brother Raju, for your wonderful presentation, for your wonderful discourse that you have presented to us in Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 
10 verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for an example. Yeah. And they are written for our, our demonition upon whom the end of the world are come. So we appreciate your discourse so much. May our dear Heavenly Father bless you so much as we uh, learn and uh, we appreciate it, having also illustrated uh, what happened to the Israelites. And it also would be indeed what would happen to us. And he also taught us that the flesh is uh, the flesh, the flesh is trying to stop our uh, consecration vow, which we did have to fight and fight until to the end. And you say that when we live after the flesh, indeed we shall surely die. But when we live after the spirit, we shall be alive. So we thank you so much. And also the servant of God, Moses, uh, indeed was meek. And in all his meekness, yeah, he, was, he was unable even to reach the Nakana, which his meekness can't be compared to anybody in this world. And indeed, it is a great lesson to us, which we would also have to uh, try to see our calling and to make sure that we work properly according to our calling. We do appreciate your discourse so much for this. May we also take this opportunity now to welcome brethren who will be having questions and also post it and will be the one brother Raju to pick them as they would uh, give their question to you. Thank you. I open this door for anybody to raise his or her hand for the question on the discourse that you are presenting. Thank you. A hand here, brother Raju. Uh -huh. Thank you for your service, brother Raju. Uh, thank, thank you for leading us into these great lessons, which our God intended for us. It is indeed a blessing. One of our sister here has a question. So ask your question. Uh, your name and the question. Yes, uh, I'm called Sister Jacqueline Chan, and I really thank God for for the discourse you made, Brother Raju, because this... okay. hope I'm clear without now. Um. Uh, well, uh, beginning uh, this month, I was really studying hard, and all of a sudden. Uh, I don't know what happened. I just became lazy. I became lazy and I keep asking myself, what is really happening to me? And I've learned from your discourse that uh, uh, at times we are relaxed and yeah, we, we are relaxed. And that's when the, uh, the devil attacks us. But then this time I, I wasn't in a vacation or watching movies or anything. My spirit was really willing. But I, my, my question is, why did I all of a sudden become lazy? I didn't want to study. And yet I had to. So my question is, why did I just all of a sudden become lazy? And yet uh, this zeal was ongoing in my life. Over. Uh, thank you, dear Sucha. Thank you for your wonderful question. First of all, uh, I would like to thank my Lord God uh, Almighty uh, for helping me to prepare this subject. Uh, as you told, uh, that's the experience which uh, each and every brethren have because we are still living in the flesh and we have this treasure in this earthen vessel. So, the earthen vessel is actually a leaky vessel. It's not a, something that is made up of metal. So it is an earthly pot. If we just keep water in the earthly pot, 
it doesn't stay for many days it gets dried up there are pores in it the water drains out so similarly it is with the holy spirit god has begotten us with the holy spirit he has sealed us with the holy spirit but it is our responsibility to be always filled with the spirit by daily watching the word of god daily studying the word of god attend brethren's meeting have fellowship with them have fellowship with the brethren who are matured enough who encourages us to stabilize us to share your testimonies to share our experiences and gain some strength from the brethren so in this way what happens that we always tend to be in the lord so when we are forgetting our vow of consecration that's what the flesh does the our devil our adversary is like a roaring lion going around who we may deceive so we should be very cautious so each and every step of ours we should be always watching and we should be very careful for this reason everybody has this experience so there is nothing that you should be discouraged nothing should you should doubt on anything that's a good way see we are all still in the flesh so we need to overcome so how do we get the strength daily study more of the word of god daily take strength from the scriptures so this gives us more strength more energy to stay in the lord and have fellowship with the brethren so that tries to make up so this is how we try to overcome and uh, you see uh, the bible uh, gives lot of examples uh, i'll tell you one incident uh, that is there in the tabernacle sister in the tabernacle one should go into the holy place on the left hand side there was a candlestick but on the dead opposite to it there was a table of the shoe bread there were six and six loaves of bread upon which a handful of incense was kept and in between these two very close to the second veil was the incense altar daily morning and evening it was the responsibility of the high priest to come go inside clean the twigs of the candlestick remove all the dirt put oil in it so that the light should never go off see that was the work uh, daily he has to do he was never supposed to leave that one so similarly sister you have that experience really thank god for that one god is helping you to realize that you have some dirt do you have some weakness everybody has got that weakness so we need to take that opportunity and clean it daily we need to clean it as we keep on cleaning it you see the oil increases the holy spirit increases as we are emptying ourselves more of the spirit of the world god's spirit comes more into us and the dead opposite to is was the table of the shoe bread if the light shines brighter then only you could clearly see the bread with the holy spirit guidance you can really understand more of the scriptures what is the advantage of understanding more of the scriptures you get the strength as you eat more food you get the strength so similarly we get the strength and the courage but that was not the end the priest had to take a handful of incense and put it upon the incense altar morning and evening now what does that represents after cleansing ourselves after understanding more of truth from the scriptures god puts us to practical test see this to a theory the candlestick and the table that's a theory but in between you see both of thing a very important part which is very close to the second veil before we making our calling election sure we should pass this test daily we have been put into the incense altar the incense is there the coal is there the heat is there but how our character 
is determined it is only when we put upon the trial upon the fire when we are put on fire so how do we behave how do we react how do we think how do we move ourselves that is the incense that comes out if the incense is a good smelling incense it will really be pleasing to the lord if it is not pleasing to the lord that will be a incense very detestable thing so we won't be accepted so as you said the bible also says in proverbs a righteous man falls seven times but yet he gets up so getting up is important sister always falling is not important because we are still falling we will be falling until death but uh, god sees our heart god doesn't see our how physical we are trying to brother you fight you have you have seen other hands waiting you can okay. take them one by one okay thank you anybody else Yes, you can pick them in their order, Brother Lachim. Timothy Lachim. Uh, greetings, Brother Raju. I just had a question regarding uh, a, the Bible verse which you use from the Psalms 91, that uh, a thousand uh, may fall on the left side, and I am paraphrasing. And uh, it was just interesting to me how you use this Bible verse. I always had the impression that it's about our enemies, but I, if I remember correctly in your discourse, it seemed like they were, this Bible verse was about our brethren who are going cold. So I just want to make sure if you want to comment on it so I understand correctly your idea there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear brother. So, uh... You have clearly understood the scriptures. That is one of the interpretation uh, because uh, we are living in the very uh, last stages where the door is uh, uh, soon to be shut. Uh, the scripture says uh, in the Gospels uh, that the uh, uh, son shall betray the father, the father shall betray the son. And uh, this is actually got a spiritual meaning. When we, uh, when we had a discourse, uh, a few uh, uh, months before uh, in Romania, uh, based on the Revelation study, so where the uh, last uh, part of the church, how they are glorified. So it is during that time that there shall be a lot of filtration among the brethren, where the brethren will bet betray the brethren who are in the truth, and that will be a test for them, a test of the character, because we read in sixth volume that uh, in the love, there are four stages, and the last stage. Uh, is the love of the brethren and the love of the enemies. Uh, Brother Russell clearly says that many shall fall in this love of the brethren. So this is actually a test, brother, uh, test for the dear flock. Uh, how do they uh, prepare themselves? So this is one of the interpretation of the scriptures, brother. So hope it is clear. Thank you. Lord bless. Thank you. Next, uh, Sister Eva. Želela bi da pozdravim svu braću i sestre na ovom divnom kongresu. Drago mi je biti sa vama i da sam vas sve upoznala. Bi da pitam da imam ja takav problem da imam osjećaj da sam umorna. Sister Eva, she have a question. Nekada. Ok. May I know the question? Da. Imam isto pitanje. Sister Eva, she have a similar question for the sense of weariness. Imam osjećaj 
she have a feeling that she is not adequate for all things and uh, listening this your know, discourse she realized many things and uh, she wanted to ask what she must do beside uh, things that you uh, presented to us she knew that she must uh, work more on herself as we all must do but if you maybe if you can uh, give to her some additional explanation She, she thought that maybe uh, some uh, illness is in the, the but she thinks that it is the the flesh is in the question the greatest enemy are our flesh she well, she won't, if, if you can give to her uh, uh, some, uh, maybe a few other things to explain as regards to that. Thank you. Thank you, dear Sister Eva. <clears throat> That's a very wonderful uh, question and a very important question as well. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, as you are already aware, as, as are already informed so many things, uh, uh, additional points, uh, if you need to uh, think about uh, how overcoming, is that uh, first of all, uh, uh, you need to pray, <clears throat> keep all your uh, uh, feelings, uh, pour out all your feelings before God. Uh, there are a lot of sufficient of articles in the reprints. Uh, Brother Russell <clears throat> tells how do we need to pray to the Lord. Uh, we need to open ourselves to the Lord. And uh, uh, some part of the weaknesses or uh, uh, some things which we really uh, don't like to share with anybody, uh, we can definitely pour our hearts to the Lord. He will give us a strength. And the second thing is that they, you should dedicate your time to study the word of God. Of course, sometimes it's difficult, but uh, during these modern days, we have a lot of uh, YouTube links, a lot of recordings. You should have, uh, we, if you're not able to study ourselves, uh, we can take so much of time to hear and listen to the recordings or see some videos uh, especially the brethren discourses and all, which strengthens us, that really uh, uplifts the brethren. And next thing is that you have sufficient of fellowship with the brethren uh, in your ecclesia. And uh, uh, physical gathering of the ecclesia, I really encourage it. Uh, that's what uh, Apostle Paul tells in Hebrews 10, 35 also, that you should not forget the gathering of, uh, physical gathering of the brethren uh, uh, that really encourages us. And uh, other suggestion is that, <clears throat> Uh, the brethren need to actively involve in any of the meetings uh, or any of the work for the Lord. It may be translating, it may be recording, it may be some uh, script reading, it may be any other activity. Let it be any small, small activity, witnessing activity, door-to-door -door witness, uh, or printing, uh, uh, publishing the material, uh, distributing the pamphlets. Uh, there are a lot of works you can do. So uh, these things will really additionally help your sister. I hope uh, uh, these are my suggestions. I hope that this will uh, definitely be practically useful to you, sir. Lord bless you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? There was one more brother. I don't remember the name. Brother or sister who had lifted their uh, hand, but I forgot to call them. Alex. Alex. Okay. Yeah. Brother, your question, brother? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, Brother Alex, East Africa, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, you have shown us that uh, from the book of Deuteronomy 5, verse 17, 18, uh, those uh the those of the Israelites who lagged from behind were 
were attacked by the, the enemy, Ameriki. And uh, now that uh, in the new creation that is the journey, it appears that uh, those weak in faith, or rather the young one, because even in nature has said that uh, the young ones are more uh, in the danger of predators, in the danger of, uh, of uh, to be attacked by the, the predators. Now we see that uh, it appears that uh, in the new creation, we don't have a journey. Those are especially in the milk, the young ones, the, those uh, who have uh, those whose their consecration is not very stable, me yeah, than those now considering the the scripture we were studying in chapter ten. Now we go to verse. Being a tadding, take care of even without being told, you can see there are those who are more mature spiritual or rather growth, those who see more appear their consecration are higher than the, those young ones. Now, how can you harmonize that so that we may, we may understand? I would like to get the logic there. Yes, over. Okay, uh, so let me first uh, uh, tell the question which you asked uh, more clearly. Uh, please confirm uh, uh, whether I am correct in understanding your question, brother. So you're trying to your your question was that uh, in Book of Deuteronomy, the Amalekites uh, came and attacked the weaker ones from behind. So those uh, things uh, the brother interpreted in the subject that uh, these are the women and the children. So spiritually, if we compare, so these are the weaker ones. <clears throat> so how do you, or how can you compare this one, uh, or, or how right it is to compare to the matured uh, uh, Christians' uh, uh, warfare in the spiritual work of life? I hope, uh, is the question right, brother? Is that's what the Question you asked, or uh, is there any uh, corrections that has to be made in my interpretation? There, I think that it would appear more, more, more good, uh, well, or good that one. It would be okay that way. So, my, my question is okay, or uh, anything that else? That one, it's okay, it is okay that okay. way. Okay, so. Uh, thank you for your question, brother. So, what I would like to answer is that uh, there, the Amalekites attack the weaker ones. That's the main point. It might be male, female, uh, or uh, what do you say, uh, any weaker pa uh, old persons also. But spiritually, if you take, the brethren was strong in the Lord. Uh, the brethren who are in the truth for many years, they have this type of experiences. This type of experiences is common for everybody, irrespective of how many years you are there in the truth, irrespective of how strong you are in the truth. That is really applicable to me also. I still have that experience in my life. So I am sure that every brother has this experience because uh, until we pass beyond the veil, we are part of the church. And in this church, there is a little flock, there is a great multitude, there is a second death. So we don't know who are who. It's all to be revealed only after we pass beyond the veil. So in this broad view, these experiences are common to all the brethren who are having such type of experiences. Okay, you you in case we were very strong, if we feel that we are strong. We may be weak uh, 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 based upon a heart condition. So our flesh or the devil may take opportunity to attack us at that time. 
So this is what uh, we are trying to tell, brother. I hope uh, my answer is satisfactory. Uh, Lord bless, brother. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? Okay, one question is put there in the chat. Yeah, there's one. Uh, there's one question here. By brother Stanley. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can thank I read the question much, if you don't mind? Thank you very much, brother Raju. Okay. I'm so blessed for this course which you have just presented. I give grand thanks to our heavenly Father. Uh, my question uh, is about the Moses' smite of the rock. Uh, we see that uh, God had given uh, Moses an instruction that uh, should speak to the rock. But instead of speaking, we see that he smite the, the rock. Uh, that was, I'm seeing that there is a scene of uh, uh, failing to do, uh, uh, to obey the instructions of the Lord. But I'm seeing that God permits water to come out of the rock. Uh, why do you think that God had to permit a uh, rock to give out uh, water? He said, uh, since uh, uh, Moses had disobeyed the Lord. Secondly, second question. Uh, Moses did that act as a result that uh, uh, all these people were so thirsty. They, they are in need of water. So uh, in so doing, well, he did it in rebelling against God. So what is uh, what could be our attitudes towards uh, for our fellow brethren when they are in a such situation of lacking, when they are thirsty, and they need uh, our help? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. Thank you for your question. Uh, you asked me two questions. Uh, the first question is that uh, uh, Moses uh, smote the uh, the rock, but it water came. So it actually worked for uh, it's actually God permitted. Now, why punish Moses for that one? I hope my question is right. Uh, understanding of your question is right. First thing. The second thing is that uh, uh, God knew very well that they were uh, thirsty. So why uh, frustrate them? So before only we can give them water. So I hope my both of the understanding of the questions are right, brother. Yes. Okay. So let me take some time to answer the questions. The first thing is that, see, Moses smote the rock. First time, what Moses did was correct. There was nothing wrong. The second time, in, when he was supposed to speak, he smote the rock. That was the thing which displeased the Lord. So why did God permit it? God could have stopped Moses. Or God could have already clearly told Moses, you're going to do like this one. So be careful. Why did not God warn or uh, correct Moses before only? Because that was a test for Moses. And that was the severest God's judgment which God had to set as an example for us. The Bible says all things written aforetime time are written for our admonition, for our encouragement. So we might learn lessons. God is never going to compromise with sin. Let it be small, smallest of minute of the mistakes. It is done purposely. God would never forget. God would never forgive us and give us the crown. Done out of weakness of the flesh, always we have the robe of righteousness. So God had to set these examples so we may understand the better character of God and work out of salvation with fear and trembling. First point. And the second point is that for the second question, God could have never frustrated the people of Israel. He should have, before asking them, God could have given them. But God did not give because the scripture says, there's a scripture in Exodus which says, 
there was a shortcut way for the people of Israel to travel from Egypt to promised land. But God never took them in that way. Particularly God took them in this way so that they may see the wonders of God and thus their faith may be increased. In spite of taking them in such a wonderful way, seeing all these miracles, the, the parting of the Red Sea, just imagine in your mind, can a river be parted just like that? Is it so easy? That is was given to strengthen their faith. In spite of all these things, every moment, every point of your life, you keep on grumbling that God did not like it. So, God wants the people who worship him with spirit and in truth, voluntarily. So, this uh, character was not there in Israel. And God wanted to prepare them. Hence, uh, these were permitted as a trials and a testings for them. So similarly, it's in our way also. I hope uh, uh, this uh, answer is satisfactory for your question. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Lord bless. There's one more question that is posted in the chat. If you don't mind, uh, can I take two minutes to uh, read that one and answer? Brother? But Eliezer is okay? Yes, we have time. Okay. In first Corinthians, there's a chat that is put in uh, uh, in the Zoom. First Corinthians 15, 26. Why death is termed as enemy too? I have noticed from your presentation that we have four enemies. The world, the devil, the flesh and the Babylon. Very good question, brother. That's a very good question that we have these four uh, enemies. But why not? Uh, death is our enemy. You see? See, when we are speaking about this subject, this subject is related to the new creature. So, new creature has these four enemies. What about uh, death, brother? Is death not an enemy to the new creature? No, brother, no. Death is actually a gateway for heaven. In Revelation 14, 13, it says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. You see? There's no scripture in the Bible which calls that death is a blessed thing. There's only one scripture that calls a blessed thing is a death. And it doesn't speak for the world. I'll read that verse for you. And I, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yeah, said the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. You see, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord since 1878. This death is not an enemy at all. It's a gateway for us to go to heaven. In Psalms 82, 6, it says, no, you're all uh, children of the Most High, but yet you shall die like one of the princes. So death is a very common thing and death is there. It should be there because we need to prove our faithfulness to God until death. If there is no death, we can't prove faithfulness to God. And one more thing is that Regarding 1 Corinthians 15 chapter verse you quoted, it is speaking about the death, the Adamic death that is going to be there in the thousand years. That is going to be destroyed only at the end of thousand years. So that has got nothing to do related with the gospel age. The 1 Corinthians 15 chapter verse what you said, that has got nothing to do with the gospel age. That enemy is the death that is going to be destroyed in the thousand years. 1 Corinthians 15 26. I hope my answer was satisfactory, brother. Uh, Lord bless. Anybody, any questions? Anybody, any brother, any sister? Yes, Chairman, Brother Lojas. Thank you, dear brethren. Uh, thank you, Brother Eliezer. Uh, thank you, Brother Igor. And uh, all the other brethren also who are co associated in this conference. Thank you all for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Brother Raju. Thank you once again for the clarification that you have given on the questions. 
being raised by brethren, hoping that uh, their question has been answered and it has also given us much strength. And it has also, uh, it has also increased our knowledge and faith in Christ Jesus. So with this one, could I now take this opportunity to call Brother Eliezer to play him 188 